Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We have people continuing to join us, but I want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, and I'm thrilled to welcome everybody to what is the September meeting of the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition. My name is Ifia Duba, and I'm honored to serve as the executive director for the organization. Uh, for those who may be new, the organization was, uh, came together in 2008, although it was federally designated as a nonprofit in 2015. And the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition is a nonpartisan coalition of individuals and organizations that envision a socially just and respectful society that's invested in the common good so that individuals, families, and the community can achieve their fullest potential. We are rooted in a set of shared principles um, and continue to educate and advocate to create systemic change. At this point, we're thrilled to call over 300 individuals and nearly 50 organizations, our partners, joining us and speaking with one voice about systemic public and private reforms that are needed for the economic security of and overall being of individuals and families in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, anybody who is new to us today, I encourage you to visit our website at bcwac.org to learn more, take a look at the principles that are posted there and consider joining us as a partner. I'm gonna just offer a couple quick notes before we get started on the conversation today. Um, one, there'll be some announcements at the end, but one that I'll mention right now is that our next coalition meeting is scheduled for November. So you'll see a save the date coming out, but feel free to write now, write November 20th on your calendar and plan to join us then. Um, we will be recording today's conversation. So if you give us a little, a few days, uh, you'll be able to access it through a link. And then, most importantly, we are recording this in the Zoom webinar format. So if you have a question at some point, please click the Q&A at the bottom center of your screen. I'm gonna do my best to keep an eye on that. We do have time allotted at the end for questions, but please feel free to type a question at any time and I'll try to keep an eye along the way. So this morning we're gathered to discuss racial equity, advocacy, and the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition. While racial equity inequity is pervasive and hurts everyone, it does not do so in the same ways. While it's challenging, confronting racial inequity is a benefit to everyone. This work is absolutely a practice. It is not a perfect. I think we are all, have all learned and continue to learn that. And the choice to engage in these conversations is a choice to make ourselves vulnerable. It's a choice to unlearn prejudice, um, and it's a choice to take responsibility. It's also a choice to make a lifelong commitment to learning, questioning, and confronting inequities. Um, it's choosing to act on behalf of individuals, organizations, and communities in a way that is rooted in a belief that those things can change and do change. Um, understanding all of that, when we engage in courageous conversations, similar to this one, we have to agree to listen generously to each other, assume good intent, speak our truths respectfully. Um, we need to go in knowing that we're gonna experience some discomfort and that we are gonna be okay with that because this is ultimately brave space, um, that we'll stay engaged with each other, that we're gonna care about the people we're conversing with even more than just finding common good. And we're gonna accept that there's gonna be non-closure. Everything is not going to be resolved in a satisfactory manner by the end of the 90 minutes that we spend together this morning or two hours that we spend together. You know, there's gonna be some non-closure and we're gonna continue and keep coming back to these conversations. This particular conversation started in the boardroom for the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition and I'm proud to say that I work with a board that looks like so many other boards of nonprofit organizations. Um, and I'm deeply fortunate and very grateful that they were willing to not only engage in conversations around racial equity, but encouraged this conversation this morning in this format. Um, I'm also incredibly fortunate to be 
joined today by four really incredible <clears throat> leaders who I um, am going to very proudly call my friends and co-conspirators. <laughs> and they have generously gifted all of us with their time and their wisdom and their willingness to lean into their own vulnerability and their own truths to be as part of their commitment to strengthening the work of this coalition and the, or the communities we live in. So I'm gonna start by sharing who they are and why I'm excited to have them join me this morning. And then I promise you'll get to hear someone other than me talk. <laughs> um, I'll start with Carol Austin, who is the executive director at First Up. Uh, for over 50 years, First Up has been committed to ensuring that children have access to the highest quality care and education possible. I'm very excited to have Carol with us this morning because uh, she's somebody who I've uh, not known for a very long period of time, but long enough that she always reminds me to grab the opportunity to speak up and speak truth. And so I'm excited that Carol's with us this morning. Karen Downer is also here and she's the president of the Bucks County NAACP. The NAACP ensures the political, educational, social, and economic quality of all persons and eliminates race-based discrimination. I'm excited to have Karen join us because she brings a gentle spirit that really should never be underestimated and has a steadfast commitment to this work and this effort. Marianne Frey is the Chief Executive Officer at Maternity Care Coalition. The Maternity Care Coalition improves the health and well-being of pregnant women and parenting families and enhances school readiness for children zero to three. I'm excited to have Marianne here because she very generously reached out to me a few months ago and agreed to be my accountability partner in these conversations. And then Guillaume Stewart, last but not least, is the executive director of the YWCA Bucks County, dedicated to eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. I'm excited to have him here today because he has demonstrated his leadership in this work in many, many ways, not the least of which includes a brilliant series of conversations that uh, the YWCA hosted this summer. Um, I will say about all four of them, I'm very excited. They are uh, admirable and strong leaders and partners in the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition. And this was a delightful way for me to be able to come together with people that I trust and enjoy and have laughed with, but also know um, that I can be vulnerable with and know that it's a space with people who understand the heaviness that we are carrying, um, frankly, a good bit of at this particular moment in time. So I think everybody's heard from me enough for a period of time right now. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm going to start off by asking everyone to share a little bit about how they came to know the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition, um, whether it was personally, through your organization, some blend of the two. Um, so Carol, if you don't mind, would you start us off? Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, you know, funny story, I actually came to know the Bucks County um, Women's Advocacy Coalition by receiving a letter in the mail. <laughs> um asking um to give and i thought wow who, who is this organization this is great a women's advocacy organization unfortunately they were you know um because i started uh leading the first stop which was formerly the delaware valley association for the education of young children back in 2016. and um so prior to that i had not really been engaged in the advocacy in doing advocacy a lot in my world but uh, the organization had so um you know we had staff within the organization who were like really excited they're like yeah we should absolutely support that <laughs> so that was my first um experience of at least hearing and knowing about the coalition and then um a couple of years ago you know i attended a meeting and um and it was just really impressed by the breadth and scope of um, the work that you're undertaking here. And the, I would say the, the knowledge base of the board and the members, the deep knowledge base and, and experience base uh, um, that this coalition has. So it's quite impressive. That's it. Thanks, Carol. 
Um, Marianne, how about you? So good morning, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. And, you know, I learned about uh, Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition actually online as I was looking for, as you mentioned, accountability partners are looking for others, other leaders of color with whom I could connect and figure out how to amplify the voices of each of our organizations. And I saw the announcement that you, if you were recently named to be the executive director. So I really would say that my, um, her, my way that I came to know about BWAC was through uh, that, that announcement, your announcement. But then I, as I started to try and understand what's the connection between the two organizations, I realized that our previous senior director of advocacy had also been connected with uh, BWAC. And so as I started to unravel it, I just felt this is an incredible organization, just as Carol had mentioned, with the, you know, the breadth of support across the county. And I just felt it was an important organization for MCC to be connected with. So um, it was sort of through outreach as well as um, learning about how we had historical connections. So I'm glad to be here today. Thanks, Marianne. Karen. Yes. Greetings to everyone. Good morning. <laughs> A little early for me. Isn't that awful? I'm, I'm retired and so um, I, I choose to start my date at about 11 o'clock, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I'm really pleased and honored to be here this morning. I'm just, um, I, I was really happy that uh, to, to have been invited to this. Um, I learned about this organization through uh, Tam Sinclair. Uh, she and Peg Dater, they, um, attended uh, maybe about, uh, probably about three, four years ago, maybe. Um, the NAACP had an event and they, they supported the NAACP. And um, so they approached me and told me a little bit about the organization and invited me. And uh, it took a couple times before I, I managed to get to a meeting, but um, I was immediately very impressed. Um, first of all, as I looked around the room, so many organizations in Bucks County are represented at this organization. The other thing is that this organization supports and advocates for women. So clearly we have a lot in common because um, I, my organization advocates people of color. And so immediately there's a crossover between um, what we're interested in and what this organization is interested in. So it just seemed to be a, a really nice match. So again, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Guillaume. So good morning, everyone. How did I come in contact? So in 2017, I became a part of the YWCA team. And I actually found out about this great organization um, before I physically got to, to their meetings because my, my colleagues were saying, there's a, a few organizations, a few people here in Bucks that you have to connect with. You gotta reach out to these folks. And so as I was learning the community and during my, during my um, Bucks County tour, um, we had to stop and meet. At the time, it was um, Tam, Tam St. Clair, who, who was, uh, I believe, the president, uh, executive director at that time. And um, I, I, I had the chance to learn about the work that you guys do. And I was so inspired by it. And um, I started attending meetings. I met Ify there at my meeting back in 2017. Um, and so it really just, uh, had a good impact on me. And I said, I want to be a part of this. Um, my colleagues said, you have to be a part of this. We honor Tam as a woman uh, that has great leadership through our salute to women. I believe that was 2018. Um, but that just speaks volumes about how we were impacted by the work that you guys do and the advocacy that you do. And I'm honored to be a part of this conversation today. Thank you. 
So I, one of the things that I think um, we've all recognized as we've done this work is that there's the piece that happens in, of work that happens individually. There's things that are experienced individually. The same happens at an organizational level. And then there's what's happening in the world around us. And so I'm gonna in, invite all of you to maybe get a little personal <laughs> first thing in the morning um, and start from a place of I, you know, I, an experience that I think so many people of color have, but certainly leaders of color have had where you experience maybe a moment of aloneness um, that whether it's that you realize that you are the only one of color in the room, um, that there's maybe a topic that you're recognizing, hey, there's a conversation that's happening right now, and I'm not sure anybody else in the room <laughs> is fully understanding it or seeing it from a perspective that I might have. Um, and so talk a little bit, maybe if you have a, sh a story that you're willing to share about a that aloneness, and I'm going to let you guys unmute um, before I start to do the whole teacher like calling you person by person. Um, but unmute and just kind of naturally start to respond to this. Um, maybe share a story of when a time you've experienced some of that aloneness, um, how you managed it, and what you may think you maybe have done over time or in different rooms to kind of cope with it and accommodate the rooms that you are in, and what that feels like to do that. Yeah, I'll start. <laughs> Um, my, my background is banking, um, and, and at the time that I went into the, the banking world, uh, I was, I represented a lot of firms. Um, the, in, in a lot of, well, generally you had to kind of prove yourself, um, but then the other side of it was that wherever, wherever I would go, since I was the only minority, um, everybody knew me. <laughs> um, so that was probably the upside. Uh, however, when I say I, I was a lot of first, A for instance would be that I worked outside of Philadelphia. I worked in the suburbs and I was the first African-American to work outside of Philadelphia. Um, generally, the uh, minorities who actually did move up in the organization, um, they pretty much were either downtown Philadelphia or just, just Philadelphia in general. So um, I think the most challenging time that I had was uh, business banking. Um, business, business banking world was all white males. And so I arrive, and of course, I have the credibility factor. And these clients would give me a hard time. <laughs> just, they would just come up with, um, just, I mean, just, they would attack me for crazy stuff. And um, just, it was all, you know, they would just find issues constantly. Um, and the first large location that I worked at, pretty much, I mean, I had a very large client base. Um, I really had no one to ask what to do. I just, I was pretty much on my own. I, I didn't even have a white female to ask um, because, you know, obviously females walking into this world, it was gonna be challenging for white females as well, but there weren't any to ask. So I kind of had to figure it out myself. Um, I did learn that I needed to be a step ahead. Um, I needed to know my, my subject. Um, I needed to um, be prepared, very prepared for meetings. I needed to be assertive. Um, and, and I needed to be strong in coming across. So if I say to you, um, I need your, your statements for the last couple of years. And they say to me, huh, what do I need to do that? That's not necessary. So now I've got, I immediately have a battle. So the next thing is, so how, do you, how are you gonna handle it? Um, and I had to run into it a couple of times before I finally, finally figured out how to handle it. 
um, one, one great example was um, a, a, a client. He said, well, you know, I, it's easy for me to get loans. I can just go past you and call downtown and they'll do whatever for me. I said, yes, but they sent you to me and they obviously sent you for a reason. I need your statements. And he persisted that if I wanted them, I could go get them. They were a matter, matter of public record. And I suggested that that should make it extremely easy for him to get them for me if they were a matter of public record. So, you know, just being willing to be courteous, but, but um, you know, you don't want to lose the client either because you're losing business for the organization. Um, the other thing that I need to become, be very aware of is um, always staying calm because passion with a, when a black woman, passion indicates angry black woman. And so my, my um, body language, my attitude needed to always be calm and even and level um, so that I was getting my point across, but I wasn't being um, nasty or pushy or uh, just suggesting that I was, you know, I'm just an angry person. So, um, okay, so at the end of the day, I just learned that it was number one, how I presented myself. I learned that um, I, I became, I was a different person at work than I was at home and in my own environment at my church and so forth, I was Karen. Um, in my work environment, I had to become a, a business person. Um, I had to present myself professionally um, as a business person. It, in, you know, maybe the tone of my voice and so forth, I would sound different if I was talking on the phone with a business client as opposed to if I was talking to um, uh, someone else that I know. Um, I, I'm not sure that the difference would be always the same if I, if I was white. Um, when I say that I had to be aware, um, it was the way that I would talk on the phone, like, like kids would say to me, mom, you sound different. <laughs> when, I, when you're talking to a, a client, you, you just have to come across a little different. Um, how I feel about that, um, I, I, I live up here in Bucks County, and so I live in a white world. I grew up you know, going to a school that was, uh, there were very few minorities. Um, and I think in a way, I just adjusted that that just was the way that it was. And I just kind of felt like it came with the paycheck. So. Thank you. Others. Yeah, um, I would say that, well, I have, you know, in my entire career worked in the nonprofit sector. And um, this is the first time where I have the experience that at the decision making table and the, the leadership making table, pretty much the, the, uh, the folks are all white. And I am the one um, black person sitting at the table, which is stunning for me, given the vast numbers of people of color who actually work in the early childhood education um, field. And um, it was it, pretty startling because in moving into a situation where I'm also uh, chatting with funders, you know, I think we all naturally get into our little cliques and there's been these cliques that have already been formed for years of, of, of meeting together and knowing one another and knowing the field and doing things together. So, you know, quite easily, especially it's, it's less so now because I'm used to it and more familiar and now have a relationship with uh, many of our partners, but initially it was so confronting to walk into the room and look around and be the only uh, person of color there and not feel like you don't know the rules. Um, 
to have everybody, you know, laughing and joking and, and, and hearing on the site, oh yeah, I spoke to this person the other day who is a funder. But wow, they have a personal relationship too. They can just pick up the phone and, and, um, and talk. And not knowing how to get in there. Because that's how it was. I was like, okay, how do I get in there? You know, how, how do I build that kind of relationship? I don't feel like I know this person. I have anything in common. We don't have any history. What do we even talk about? Um, so that itself, you know, was really confronting, I'll say, and, um, and isolating. And, to, you know, to this day, it's funny because Marianne and I are in a, uh, an advisory group together. And... You know, if I'm not there, she's the only black person I think on the group, and vice versa. And um, but I think through building relationships and getting to know one another, that, that has created some of the the uh, comfort, okay, and the ability to um, then have real conversations, even about that. Um, one of the the challenges. I guess one of the things that added to that confrontation is pretty early on in my role as executive director, I attended um, our annual conference and the number of people of color, teachers of color that walked up to me and said, well, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. I almost, I was so, I really got for myself that I, the degree to which I represented hope and a new possibility for people that I was not totally present to. And so that brought a whole new set of aloneness and isolation because now I'm really conscious of how people expect me to bring about change that's never been there and make a difference that's never been made. And I'm the only one, right? So, um, so there's that added um, piece from, you know, you know, people of color too, and that expectation that now I'm the black leader, you know, finally sitting at the table. Um, so there's the added loneliness too of getting it right, having to get it right, because there's so much that is at stake and there's so much that's never changed. And people are looking to me to make that change and to make that difference. But I'm the only one <laughs> there at the, um, at the table. So it's, it's pretty, um, and, and I've chosen to actually step into that. So it is pretty confronting, but um, it, our opportunities like this and creating alliances you know, with other black leaders really makes a difference. Makes all the difference in the world, you know, to be able to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, how are you dealing with this situation? How are you handling this? Um, how are you doing? So, you know, how, how, how have I handled it? I say, I, I'm, still, I'm still handling it and dealing with it, you know, every day. But that's, that's part for the course. That's part of, you know, what it is. And every day brings something new. You know, over the years, it's been, okay, wow, am I really going to allow, go into meetings and present myself with my natural hair? Oh, my goodness. What are people going to think? You know, I've had it straight for a long time. You know, what, what are people going to think about that? So there's, a, there's, there's always something to confront um, in dealing with, you know, how, are, how am I going to be viewed? Um, am I going to be in an asset or a, or a liability if I position myself a certain way? There, there are always those questions. There's always the looking, um, for sure. So. Thanks, can I, Carol. Can I ask Carol a question? Can I ask Carol? Yeah. Um, Carol, um, do, you, do you often feel that um, you have to have the answers for all black people? You know, <laughs> yeah, there's that. And I have come into, I think, especially lately, 
Um, I'm really clear that I also don't represent, I've become even more clear, I don't represent, nor can I, every black person and every right. black voice. Right. I don't, because I have my own unique right. experience. And I think the thing is, if, if there's one thing that um, the um, racial justice movement has helped to make clear, the more we've got, been able to get in dialogue and authentic dialogue about this, is I've, I've become settled into that. And, and um, that it matters to, for everybody to be able to be included because every voice is different and is unique and it's the expression of the whole. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to go next. Um, it's just so special to hear Karen, your story, Carol, your story. I'm looking forward to being on hearing yours. Um, you know, and Ify, it's always, uh, I don't know what I don't know what the right term is to to talk about this aloneness and to think about it in a way that is both meaningful to the conversation and to others. And um, you know, I can identify with the aloneness that you described, Karen, when you were in those settings where you were being challenged and you just knew you were being um, unnecessarily challenged. And Carol, you and I know that we've been at those tables where, yes, we feel incredibly alone. If the, I think when we first had our initial conversations, I reached out to you because A, I wanted to congratulate you on being um, a new leader in our space. Not that you weren't there before, uh, you shared with me, but that feeling of aloneness, like we all have it. And how can we help one another and that to me is what's got me through the experiences. And I'll just think of, um, I try to think of what were, there's so many that could explain how a leader of, of color can feel alone in a setting. I, ch I think I'm gonna choose to talk about um, when I was like only 14 years old, which is kind of like, I wanted to understand the inception of this feeling. Like, where did it come from? Um, and I'm certain this happened way before then, but I grew up in North Philadelphia in a setting that was unusual. You know, my parents were missionaries to the United States from Jamaica, and we lived and worked at a rescue mission. So my setting as a young child from like five to, you know, when I went away to boarding school on the main line, uh, not Bucks County, but Montgomery County as a 14 year old and totally was had culture shock. I mean, I worked with homeless people as a kid, like, and I was like, people live, they like have this much money and they live like this. Um, so that was an initial feeling of aloneness, being like one of three boarding students, because I was a boarder, that was a boarding, an all girls boarding school. So there was the aloneness of like, um, there's a big economic difference uh, there was an aloneness that came from being the only black. Um, the two other students were from a program called ABC, A Better Chance, which brought together um, students of color from all around to, to go to these exclusive private schools. I was just coming from North Philly. Like, I didn't have a better chance. I just had this missionary parent that was parents that were like, cool, so let's, let's bring the black kid in. Um, but I think one experience during that period of time was there was an exchange program between the border, the borders and the day students. So this school was in, I don't wanna name it, but it was in Bryn Mawr. And the program enabled day students to spend a week in the boarding department and the border to go to the day students home for a week. So it was called an exchange program. And we had students from Nicaragua, Panama, Germany, all over that came to the school. So I was, but you had to agree, the student and the border, the, the day student and the border had to make the arrangements and the parents had to agree, blah, blah, blah. So I met this day student and I was just so excited that I was gonna go to this house and we were gonna, she was gonna come to the boarding department, I was gonna go to her house and we had it all worked out. And so she came back after we had the discussions and said, oh, Marianne, really sorry, but it's just not going to work out. And I'm like, what happened? Now, remember, I'm 14 years old. And she said, my, my, my parents just won't let a black person in the house. 
And I just remember this feeling of, well, first of all, confusion. I thought it was maybe a mistake or I knew it was a mistake, but I was like, is this for real? And now mind you, this woman, this person now, she was in my wedding and I've been married for 37 years, praise the Lord. And so we have a long-term relationship, but that moment, the feeling of aloneness was in the same way. It was like inadequate, um, not enough. And those who know me today know that the journey from that to where we are, where I am today was paved with a lot of, I'm not enough. I've got to do more. I've got to have yet another degree, yet another certification, yet another this, yet another that in order to be enough so that that person, that parent will never say, no, you can't come in. You're not worthy. Um, and that's how I think a lot of leaders feel, leaders of color um, feel is just not enough. And, um, and it's, it's, it's hurtful, but, or and, that's why I reached out to you, Ify. That's why I reached out to you, Carol. Karen, you can expect that coming. I, Guillaume, I attended all your, your, at least one of, at least two of the sessions that you put on in the summer, because I don't ever want anyone else to feel those feelings of not being enough. Because together, well, we are enough. Um, it's, it's a hard lesson, but I want to share that because I do feel that the set that, that what BWAC stands for, the coalition bringing together, there's power in that. There's transformation in that. And that's what I hang my hat on. So thanks. Thanks, Marianne. I don't know how to follow all of these, <laughs> these <laughs> stories you guys just shared. Um, and, and I think I want to say this too for the listeners. I, I have been so inspired by our meetings with with this panel, you know, uh, over the last few weeks. I've learned so much from each and every one of you. I've been inspired by your leadership. And um, I'm just grateful that you guys have uh, allowed me to be a part of a conversation like this with, with leaders that I totally um, respect and admire 100%. So I'm, I'm going to, I was just jotting down some notes. So how does it feel to be alone? I just want to share this. Before I joined um, the YWCA, I worked in a shelter for women and, and girls. Um, I started my role there working with youth. And that, that really was my passion, working with uh, teenagers, school-age kids. We were, uh, at that time, the only shelter that uh, housed teenage boys. Um, so uh, anyone familiar, and I know here at the Y we're familiar <laughs> with housing, you know how that client base can be. It can be really challenging, but I found so much reward from that. But I just wanted to share, I was just jotting down some of the emotions that I would hear from the students when we talked about the first day of school. So just to, to put it in context, for any child, if you're wealthy or poor, if you're, it doesn't matter. The first day of school is a big deal. But imagine that you are living in a shelter and you got to go to the first day of school. And here's some of the things that the teens would be concerned about. They would feel anxious. Um, they would feel nervous that people would find out that they were homeless. They would feel a uh, fear whether or not they would be accepted. And I want to say this, these emotions and, and conversations didn't come out right off the top. We had to build a relationship with the kids in order to for them to feel comfortable enough to say this, but they would be afraid that the teachers wouldn't accept them and they wouldn't understand why. These are kind of fears that they had. Um, will I make friends? Will they frown on me or treat me different because I'm poor, because I'm in a shelter? Um, and the reason I share these emotions is because I think as a leader of color, we experience this first day of school almost all the time. Um, and even though we're adults, even though we're, you know, we're <laughs> have bills and jobs and responsibilities, education, I think in certain sense, we feel like that kid going back to school on that first day, like the kids I work with at the shelter and feeling anxious and feeling, will they accept me? Feeling, will I be objectified? And do I have to speak for every person that looks like me and those kind of things? And I think what's neat about building community, which is what we try to do in the shelter with the young people is let them know that they're already accepted and that they're already enough and that they can take pride in their, their story because it's one of tragedy and triumph. And so I think 
as a leader of color, um, that's what I want. I want to be a part of a community and I want that community to be diverse. I want it to be people from all walks of life, all ages, all genders, all races, but we just want to be a part of a community and know that our essence, our being is accepted. Um, and when the shelter kids found that out and they got that confidence from us, I think it helped them emotionally. It helped them feel comfortable. They got more excited and they knew that they were a part of a whole. And I think all of our conversations around race is at the why in this conversation we're having now is about that one thing, making everyone feel a part of the whole um, because everyone matters. I love that um, imagery of the, the first day of school. Cause I will say like, I often think of it as like my, my little inner Ruby bridges. And I picture like that, right. That iconic photograph of the tiny little girl walking into <laughs> desegregate a school. And, and you think, um, right. How, like, it's absurd that I have that little Ruby bridges on, you know, in anything that I'm doing now, right. I'm, as my mother would say, on my way to 50, like, I should have outgrown, <laughs> like, if, theoretically, I should, we should have outgrown it, but it is a little bit like that first day of school, so um, I appreciate the, the the connection between kind of these different stories of aloneness and that, um, and then I think, you know, as we look for things that a broader audience can maybe grasp to, to try and understand the experiences that we describe, that first day of school is maybe a, a fairly common one. And that idea of, will I be enough when I walk in this room? Because there've been so many other times where we've been told that we're not. So that when we do walk in the room, there's always that piece of trying to be enough. So thank you all. I, and I, I just, I have to say again, this is part of what really I appreciate about this particular group and um, you know the conversations we've had is that willingness to kind of be vulnerable and share some of those moments. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit. Again, the work of this coalition is really so heavily focused on advocacy and it's um, really uh, in some ways almost very easy to, be get, to get caught up in whatever issue because there's so many that are flying around just in the diversity of the work that we all do, the organizations that we're working with. Um, but if you're thinking about advocacy in general, and especially in a setting like this where you have organizations that are trying to come together and talk about issues and advance common good. Um, what are your thoughts around um, that importance of the intersection of race and advocacy um, and the attentiveness that we maybe should pay more to, more attentiveness should be paid or, you know, what we can do to always be mindful of that intersection of race and advocacy. Well, I, I might just start out, and, and this is a very obvious one that I suspect that all of my co-panelists will reference in some different way, but similar is the intersection of any of these issues has to center on the person, or what I mean is like centering some people call them clients, patients, advocate, whatever. It's centering that voice and making certain that we, in these leadership tables, because the further we get away from the person, the more we can start to intellectualize and come up with all these solutions that we know that this is going to, you know, uh, do X, Y, and Z, and this is going to have this kind of impact. And, um, and, and it's, We've all learned in our journey of being enough, as we've talked about, we've, we've gotten these little terms and it, it takes us away from the person. So the intersection that I think is critical in this space between race and advocacy is just making sure that we don't get so far away from who the beneficiary, what, who we're working for. I'm working for the women and, and in our communities that are being disenfranchised every single day. That's who I work for. I work for my staff team. I don't work for some other institution because to me, if we focus on that, that experience, this, the lived experience, if we um, allow ourselves to stay connected to that, then even though things are spinning out of control, we know, I think you make a difference in one life. That's, that's what 
kind of galvanizes the next thing. So for me, it's just focused on being centering the, the, the person who we're trying to help. go I'll, I'll just share that i think um th this that crossroads that you just described if he it, it it allows us a platform to speak truth to power and i think over the last couple of months um just working with uh all the various groups that we work with around this i've been more inspired to be honest and to speak truth to power and uh advocacy is a part of that it provides the platform for disenfranchised people, people of color, you know, uh, women, um, people who have been left out. It gives them a platform to speak truth to power. And that's the most important thing. I think um, anytime people have won justice in society, it came from somebody being courageous, some group standing up and saying, no, I'm not, this is not fair, this is not right. Uh, women should have the right to vote. Uh, people of color, black people should be able to go to any school they want to go to or live where they want. It always took speaking truth to power. So I think agencies like yours, Ify, and, and, and the wonderful agencies rep represented in this panel, we have a unique opportunity to use our voice to challenge, to challenge the bully. And the bully is injustice. The bully is this long story of marginalizing people because they're black, because they're women, because they're gay because they're there, whatever it is so i'm excited and i'm charged up to go out and face the bully with all of you but i need everyone on this panel because you guys are super strong so i want to go out there with my team and and, and fight the bully amen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh okay well i guess i'll go next um i love the way you put it marianne um the individual uh, I think that I, I remember my mom used to always say that um, you make a difference one person at a time and it just you, it's just it's kind of like you're speaking to that um, the NAACP of course this is what we are all about um, is advocacy um, and people of color and people come to us with their story their individual stories. <clears throat> they usually come to us because they have been uh, discriminated against. Uh, and it becomes, um, I feel like it becomes our responsibility to do whatever we can to use our voice to help them, to do, to, to help them to address whatever the problem is. Sometimes it's as simple as speaking to someone. Um, I've run into when the NAACP is on the phone, then all defenses go up. So part of my job also is uh, to talk to that other person and bring them to a person to person level. Um, you know, do me a favor, please, and stop defending and let's have a real conversation. Let's talk about what actually happened. I want to hear what you have to say. I understand there's two sides to every story, but I need to understand what you have to say so that I can go back and do the, the most that I can do for my client over here. Um, and that's what I think that we always have to keep ourselves grounded that's actually what we're all about. Yes, we do these other things. We do education and we do, you know, we, we have our committees and we're addressing health issues and things like that. But I think that if we don't respond to the individual person, then I, I don't believe that there's really a reason for us to exist. I think that that's what we're all about. Um, and that's why I do believe that the Women's Advocacy Coalition, uh, I believe that that's a lot of what they do. They fight for legislation and things like that that will help people. And we, we do those things. We're, we're trying to fight. We fight, every, we're in the courts 
every day. We're behind, the NAACP is behind so many decisions that are made because at the end of the day, without legislation, if I make an agreement with you and I, and that agreement means that you're gonna do this, this, and this, and I'm gonna do this, this, and this, when I'm gone and you're gone, who's gonna hold us to, how are we gonna be held to that agreement that we had? And so legislation does that, helps to do that. But on a day-to-day -day basis, it's one-to-one, -one. it's that individual person, it's their individual problem, and they're grateful that someone has taken the time and the energy to sit and listen to what their problem is and have a discussion about how to help them with that problem. Yeah, I, I think the one point that I will make is that um, we've got to figure out a way to have the people that we are directly working on behalf of be at the table as we're making, as we're creating our plans and our advocacy agendas and our blah, 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 all of that, rather than creating it and having people sign off on it or bringing them along to a meeting over the legislator. Great, we now need you to tell your story. Um, that's disempowering. And, uh, uh, you know, at the most basic level, that's just empowering. At the highest level, I don't know that we can authentically really represent people in the policy if they're not there as part of the process. And I don't know that they, as a matter of fact, I know that mostly people don't really believe that they're represented in advocacy agendas. They're skeptical and doubt that, and with good reason. Because most of the advocacy tables I see, certainly in my world, there's not even a person of color sitting at it. Until I came along, there was no person of color sitting at the table, like zero. Um, and, and there's been a lot of skepticism around, okay, great. Yeah, what are you guys really doing anyhow? Getting this money from so-and-so to do what? We don't see any change. Um, so I think that's really critically important, both to enact the change that we think we see, but also to really authentically uh, engage people that we say that we're advocating on behalf of and to have their voices be heard and be loud and um, to really acknowledge that they have a voice and that they can be a part of this decision-making process as well. So that's what I see. I think that's such an important point, Carol. The, and, and I think um, there, there's a couple, right? The acceptance of the fact that people are, are skeptical, skeptical and with good reason, right? And so, um, right, there's this piece of being well-intentioned and wanting to be recognized as well-intentioned, but that we also have to be able to, as advocacy, as, as people sitting at those tables, setting those advocacy agendas, yeah. we have to be willing to accept that there is a uh, legitimacy to the healthy skepticism with which that agenda may be received and really respect the experience that informs that and allows for that as opposed to potentially even getting defensive about it. Or, you know, and, and, and I think I've heard this a million times, you know, we're trying to help those people. Why <laughs> can't they just accept that? And um, and so, really, kind of paying attention to is the are those voices in the creation of solutions, not just yeah. supposing that they, they, they it's not enough for them to just be the accepting and willing recipients of, you know, somebody else's perceived kindness. Right, and we have, I, I, you know, and I include myself in this, you know, we've sold out on really engaging the people that we say that we are there to serve. We say things like, well, you know, we're paying paid for this, and they don't really have time um, for it because they, they have other jobs, or, or whatever it is that we say to justify mm -hmm. not having worked it out, you know, a way that's, uh, that brings about that authentic engagement. Um, 
So, and uh, not, and, and yeah, those are real challenges. It's not like it's not a challenge, but I think it's requisite. And it, it requires changing the question, I think, to um, what would it take to engage this individual or, the, the, you know, what would, it, what would it take for it to be possible for this person to engage in the creation of the agenda? And then being willing to maybe make the accommodations, the adjustments to make yeah. participation in the creation more accessible. Um, the same way we're trying to make it accessible for ourselves, like we all figured out what time we were free to meet. <laughs> Did we figure out how to include others in that? You know what, I, I want to build on that because, you know, Carol, you bring up such a powerful point. Mm -hmm. And being redundant, it's about power because there's this, you know, there's this whole power structure that happens in the nonprofit, it's whether nonprofit or, or profit world, where, you know, those who have the power and the decisions, on be, they're, they're making these uh, actions or decisions on behalf of the poor people, you know? And, you know, guilty as charged because it's, you gotta give up power to include those folks that feeling like the first day of school. Like, I love that image, Guillaume, that makes so much sense. And so how much power am I willing to give up in service of giving it a voice to others and it's not easy you know but the thing is that that's what is required i think if you use it that is what's required if we truly believe that we are part of making the world a better place we we, we got to get this power thing we got to fix that and we got to start with ourselves so just saying well it doesn't i mean doesn't it sort of include, well, first of all, we tend to fall on cookie cutter solutions. So what's good for Sally is gonna be good for so-and-so. But if you give up that, that um, power um, and you ask them, then you run into the chance that you may not be able to do what it is that they're going to ask you to do. And so rather than taking that chance, stay where you're safe, that way you, you, you're not gonna have to say no the same way. Um, isn't that kind of part of it? Yeah, can you tell me more about that? Um, well, so, okay, so I give you, I turn the power over to you. Mm -hmm. And um, the, let, let's say it's, I don't know, let's say that it's housing. And so I come, I'm, I'm talking to you about housing and you're saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to need to put you in a, um, in a, in an apartment. Okay. I'm going to have to find, and I'm saying to you, that's not really suitable. I've got three kids. I need some place that's, that is, I, I need a three bedroom place at the least. That way I can put two of my kids in one room and one in the other. And, you know, um, and that's what I really need. But you, on the other hand, you know that that's what they really need, but you can't give them what they really need. So rather than going in that door in the first place and asking them, Instead, you stay with telling them. Yeah. So you don't have to be at the, the risk of not being able to deliver. Right. <laughs> yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I do. I agree. Hmm. I'm going to take us to a slightly difficult place. So I'm just going to put that right out there. Um, and I know, you know, when all of you heard from me yesterday, I, I you know, I just put out right the, into the, the, email that I sent to you that, you know, it's just, there's just this heaviness that was happening. Um, and I had the opportunity to speak to Karen. And so on some level, I realized I owe all of you an apology because when we spoke on Monday, I said, anything could happen between now and Friday. And, and really, I, I didn't know what that was going to unleash. <laughs> it did. Um, and, and I had this moment where I thought, oh, I really jinxed us. But you know, at, at a minimum, we're kind of right, everyone can agree we're in this historic time. 
you know, dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic, um, what we've seen in terms of having, being able to have eyes on racial unrest and a, and a cry for justice over the last several months, um, and, 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 and things that are really, right, forcing us, if we're paying attention, forcing us to get out of our small worlds and really look much larger, because this is, you know, both of those things are, are, are really transpiring across the globe. And then in the more recent parts of our, of our history here, we're processing the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, the emotions around how this 2020 election will unfold, which has, you know, so much has dominated the news about whether or not a peaceful transition of power can or cannot happen or will or will not happen. Um, and then we added to that the grand jury's decision around the death of Breonna Taylor and the messages that that sends and the weight that comes with that. Um, so I'm wondering if in this brief window of time <laughs> that all of these things has unfolded, how you all have maybe been able to gather some thoughts around that, what comes to mind for you as you kind of take all these things in and think about what does this mean for this intersection of advocacy and race? What does it mean for the work that I do as an individual that this coalition does? Um, what are some of the things that you're at least considering? If anybody has a fully formed and articulate thought, then kudos to you. And um, uh, I know that I, what I have is a lot of like <laughs> crazed thoughts, some that are very hopeful, some that are filled with rage. You know, there's the full range of emotion happening in my head, but what are some of those things that you're considering and hoping that other people are considering as they move through their day? Oh, um, for me, th th this was, I mean, just thinking about it, I found it to be very challenging. Um, one minute I'm ranting like a maniac about the Breonna Taylor thing, and the more I talk about it, the more I'm thinking, and this happened, and such and such a thing happened and how could that be and how could this be um uh, i that was i found that to be very upsetting then of course the situation with um the the, the voting so mm -hmm. we're, we're going through all this with the voting and then uh -huh. there's this big discussion about throwing out all of the um the the, the ballots uh all of the you know these ballot. I mean, I'm I'm taking my time to fill out this ballot, and it could go in the trash basically, or not be counted. Um, I guess I got a little relief from that to find out that in the state of Pennsylvania, that if legislators decided that they wanted to write something like this, it could be vetoed by Governor Wolf, and so therefore that's probably why they were talking about it so openly here in Pennsylvania because it's it they really can't do it. Um, and I, I gather that they may, there may be some other states that that's not possible. So, phew, I'm thinking, okay. And not that we're out of the woods, but at least, you know, that's like, like it's, it's my burden. <laughs> and it was like taking this burden off of me. Um, even though I have, I mean, I can vote. That's, that's what I can do. But I can't go in there and basically stop them. Out of everything, I felt like the Ginsburg, um, Ruth Bader, the Justice Ginsburg, that I, I felt I felt that to be the most upsetting um, because I I saw that as the basis to having an impact on all of those other things. With her not there. Who's going to speak up now? Who, who's, who's going to be the one who wants to make democracy look the way that I believe democracy should look? Democracy should be fair. We should be treated equally. It shouldn't matter who we are at all. And she spent her life fighting for those things, for women's causes, for for just just the fairness between people, and I I just have that feeling that um, I just distresses me. Uh, I was in a meeting 
um, when I heard the news, uh, there were, I believe about eight of us on the call. And when someone said, I have something to say, it just came over the, the, the news that she had died. And for all of us, we were like, every one of us couldn't say anything. We just kind of sat there and it, tears were coming. And I, we all had to just get off the, the phone, I mean, off the call. We couldn't think of anything else on the subject that we were talking about, it just all just went away. And it was just this, this, this feeling of disaster. Where are we going from here? What are we gonna do? What's gonna happen? Um, um, who, who's gonna replace her? Who has, it's almost like I felt like, who has the right to replace her? Like we need another person like her and we're not going to get that. So what's going to happen? What? What? I, I, that was just out of the week. Um, that had the the, the biggest impact on me, I believe. Um. So. The Brianna Teller thing has really been weighing on my mind and my heart um, over the last couple of days. Uh, I think it really was, um, it was devastating for those of us who want to believe in a just society, in a just uh, criminal system or legal system. Um, I think we were let down by our judicial system um, I'm a big fan of uh, Justice Ruth, and um, I, first I should say we have so many pictures of her in my all in, in, in the, y, the YWCA because she's such a rock star and, and, and such an advocate for for good work. But that decision that came down um, did not demonstrate consistency with the efforts and energy of Ruth Guinnessburg, and I was disappointed for Brianna. I was disappointed for her family. I think um, as a person of color, as a black man, I look at that and I say, wow, um, this woman was asleep in her bedroom. So not even sleeping is a safe activity um, in our community. And that means we have to do more work. Um, so I was disappointed. I was hurt. Um, I, I, call, I, I don't have children, but I call my nieces. I have a lot of nieces and nephews and told them how much I love them and how much I care about them and how much they are important to me as an uncle um, because Brianna's life really uh, was taken away from her and, and her husband for no just reason. And I was disappointed and I had all those feelings that you talked about, Ify, of rage, of anger, of how many more incidents like this have to happen before we realize that something is wrong and that we have to do more work. And um, advocating for justice for Brianna is not taking anything away from anyone else. It's actually just saying that everybody, black people, brown people, women, deserve fairness and equity. And society is better off when we all have access to that. And me getting access to that is not taking away anything from anyone else. Um, because justice is big enough for everyone to participate in. And um, Brianna Taylor uh, did not get that this week. Well, you know, when George Floyd was murdered earlier this, um, this summer, I had a town hall, a series of them with the staff to really just collectively process our guilt, not guilt, excuse me, our grief, although maybe there's guilt there too. And, um, and I, w I wanted to do that yesterday and I, I just, I didn't get to it and I said, I'm gonna do it today, but we got to make space for this stuff. Karen and Guillaume, you're, I too, I think like all of us feel the injustice of what has happened. And um, I was talking to a staff member yesterday and we were just both basically crying about what's going on. But I, you know, 
I feel this heavy responsibility of being hopeful. And it, the it, it, I don't know if responsibility is the right word because um, it might imply that I don't genuinely feel hopeful. Um, and maybe there are moments that I don't. But I would say that as leaders of organizations where we have people looking to us to model the way, to chart the path, um, we have to, you know, we have to look back at how do we get here? And the hope that I get is when I think about Martin Luther King, I know that, or I think of leaders that have faced similar challenge, adversities. Um, and we are here today on their shoulders. I'm, I'm just, I've got to grasp that Breonna Taylor's injustice is not the end of the story. And that we can have a better and more just tomorrow if we just don't give up. We just, we have to be resilient and we just can't give up because then her death is in vain. So. Yeah, I think to that end, Marianne, um, I think the enemy that is crouching at the door is um, resignation and cynicism. And um, it's, it's an enemy that I know for me, I've got to kind of, and I think us all, we've got to kind of keep watch on because it is so easy to descend into despair and then do nothing um, and to stay there. It's very easy. Um, you know, we are living in a time right now where I am, the social and emotional health of our children and people is that's that's another crisis and and in 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 real danger it's it's a real fall fall out of everything that's happening here um and that's scary so a couple of things so i was not surprised that the brianna taylor verdict in the least um and i've tried to actually not watch anything with regard to that i'm not in the least surprised how long it took i kind of expected it to go the way it went and um with justice ginsburg's passing i thought oh my gosh i thought we'd be like punished or cursed what's going on i was so sure she would at least make it through the election and then to have this happen it was like how many more slaps in the face? <laughs> How many more, you know? So, so, but once again, you know, I'm, I'm monitoring how much I let in <laughs> to my space around that um, so that I can be sure to, you know, stay the course and be in action. So, you know, for me, I, you know, my staff, we're out there, we have these cards, we were trying to get to some childcare programs and, and speak to families about voting. And I decided I need to be on the front line doing exactly that. So, you know, sign me up for a few, you know, anything I can do actively, not just talking about it or mobilizing my staff or creating something for us as an organization, but anything I can do actively too in speaking to people and making that kind of a difference. Maybe I can also you know, turn someone who wasn't going to vote. I don't know. But um, for me, the response against um, cynicism and resignation and for really making a difference is to, is to let me get my body out of my suburban house <laughs> and into Philly or other places or even here in Delaware County and talk to some people about voting and make a difference there. Can I just share something? Absolutely. Um, I just want to point out, I, I love the comments of, of, of the colleagues here. I just want to point out that um, justice and equity, um, we have that in endless supply if we seek it. It's not like other resources where maybe we might run out of oil, you could run out of money. Um, we know clients that we work with every day that run out of money and need support. 
But justice and equity is infinite if we want it as a society, if we want it as a community, if we want it in our organization. So we don't have to hold justice from people in the fear that we might run out of it. It's for everyone. Everyone can participate in that. And, and again, what happened with Brianna reminds me that there are people who feel that justice, um, we're on some, you know, plan on earth where we can't have it for everyone. And I want to challenge that. I want to practice courage in this moment and challenge that and say, equity is an endless supply. Justice for uh, Brianna, justice for women and women's rights, justice for homeless people. It's an endless supply if we apply it, if each of us do it through advocacy, through building community, through speaking truth to power. Um, there's, no, there's no shortage of justice. We just have to put our foot down and apply it. And I wanna challenge myself to do that. Um, and I wanna challenge the folks who think that there is uh, not room enough in equity for everyone to be involved. I, I, I decline to accept that position. Um, and, and I assert that there's enough justice on earth for everyone. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, I, I'd like to say that um, I think that this week in particular, um, we, of course, John Lewis, we lost him such a short time ago. Um, but all of it coming together, I just, I feel like... Um, we just can't stop. We just have to keep going. And we have to be like John Lewis. We just have to, be, to not let anything stop us. Um, the more of the, you know, the, the, this was just a, a, a banner week. Um, but at the same time, it's, you just look around and you say, okay, so I just have more work to do. And I just have to work harder. And I just have to keep pushing. And I have to be willing to use my voice um, and, and, and try and speak up and not be afraid to speak up and speak out. And I, I think that this just reminds us, um, while I get upset about a lot of the things that are going on, the one thing that I keep praying for is that people will realize where our democracy stands and they will stand up. People have stood up in the past and I just pray that this is the time that people will realize as I, I do, I truly believe that as African-Americans, we've always been reaching for all men are created equal. We've always pushed for that. We've always believed in what America is all about. We, we've believed that in our souls. And we, I believe that that's what keeps us all going. That's what keeps us all fighting because we're always reaching for that, that ring, that cold ring that we that everybody is is being treated fairly and and so forth and i think that these times um remind us and i think that we just have to keep working at it we just have to keep pushing and we just have to we just have more work to do and we just have to work harder and 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 we can't stop we just cannot stop thank you for that i'm going to just take a moment to let people know um, I just want to remind people listening that if they have questions, they can type them into the q and I'm keeping my eye on that. I know that um, there's some there and I, that I will I'll integrate into the conversation shortly. Um, there's a couple things that I want to make sure that we I, I hear from you guys about, very specific to the Women's Advocacy Coalition. Um, and I think early on in our conversations as a group, um, I think it was Carol who used the language of tending to racial equity. And, um, and I like that idea that, that the imagery of it being something that you have to take care, you have to care for and be mindful of. Um, so, so I'm kind of curious to know, hear from all of you what you see as opportunities for the Bucks County Women's Advocacy Coalition in particular. 
um, to kind of really tend to racial equity in the work that we're doing. Um, I'm also going to let you know, and you don't have to answer these two things at the same time, I'm hoping that everybody came up with like some recommended book, podcast, etc. because I'm going to ask you guys that next. So if you didn't, scribble that down too. <laughs> I'm warning you. <laughs> and if you're like me and you couldn't narrow it down to one, I, I might let that slide. But first, I'm very interested in what you see as opportunities for the Women's Advocacy Coalition to really tend to this the idea of or, and take care of racial equity in its work. I think that um, I'm jumping in, but I think there is a lot that I don't know. <laughs> so, you know, in, in speaking, I may, I'm going to speak generally and, and hope that I, that I hit a target. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would say a couple of things. Either I really am committed to ensuring that the people that we are advocating about are included in the conversation. And even as I was sitting here, I thought, okay, great. You know, part of this is, you know, they should be included when I'm doing fundraising and, and in the grant that, you know, they get paid also, like we're getting paid to participate um, in terms of their jobs. So I really challenge and um, all of us, including the Bucks County Coalition, if you're not already doing this, to, to take that on, to really look deeply inside of all of your initiatives to really ensure that uh there it's equitable and uh, you know in terms of voice and um the other thing i would say is to be loud about it like to really take a stand public stand um let me think about you know whether allyship is the term the intern or the out term you know we have okay maybe that's a passe term or if it's still current but um, Black people and people of color have never won major victories that I know of just on our own. And I don't think there's a need to. You know, when, you, when we look at the streets, we see there's so many people from diverse backgrounds protesting. That's the way we want it. That's the way it needs to be. That's the only way I think true transformation change is going to happen if we all get that this isn't a black issue this is a human issue <laughs> this is a human issue this is you know to the benefit of all of us to have all of us win to have every to have people succeed to have voice it, we all benefit to guillaume's point you know about there being enough justice out there there's enough of everything out there, right? We already know that there's enough food in the world to feed the world. There's enough, you name it, justice, equity, food, housing, there's enough of everything there to meet the need of every single human being. Um, so I would say like, find a way to, to be public about it, even at risk of feeling like, oh my gosh, somebody may challenge us or we may get our head shut off. Because I know one of the challenges that many organizations um, face is getting it right. right. You know, we're so cautious, we get cautious. Okay, gotta say it the right way or do the right thing. It's gotta be this perfect thing. But um, once again, to Guy's point about courage, I think it's time to just step out and do something and do something publicly. And this is a step inside of that, but it may also be preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> In terms of the people who are here. <laughs> How can we get this all out of all over Bucks County? Not just the people who actually are the, the true believers. Yeah. Other thoughts about what opportunities you see within the coalition? I'm on. Okay. That's why I'm responding. If I'm, I'm kind of quiet, is I'm not sure what you 
I've got to learn more about what the coalition is doing. So that's sort of why I'm a little quiet and I'm, I'm wanting to understand, have you done like an internal audit in terms of knowing what, you know, all of the organisms, like a structure that the um, partners have that aligns to what everybody else is doing? I just, I'm not sure. Um, are you asking perception? Perception is fine. I mean, I'm kind of curious what, you know, from where you guys are sitting and your roles of leadership as partners of the coalition, what do you see as opportunities? Well, okay. My, my perception, um, I think uh, Marianne sort of said it, um, and Carol did also. Um, I, I don't feel like I really know the full extent of what the uh, Women's Advocacy Coalition does in this area. Um, and maybe that's an answer within itself. Um, I, I believe that, um, I believe that your heart is there. <clears throat> um, but I believe that the focus of the organization pr pretty much has been women. And um, some of the things that that you are fighting for are things that I see as beneficial to uh, people of color um, across the board. Um, I, I, I just know a lot of the legislation and things like that that you're fighting for, for pay equity and things like that. The benefit is broad. Um, and that's kind of the way I've always I've looked at this organization. Um, so I, I don't know if that's actually an answer answer. Um, uh, I, I, I know a number of the people that are involved in, in this organization that I know that I've talked to. Um, I, I, I know kind of where they, like what their feeling is, but I just, I guess I've always looked at this organization as um, their agenda wasn't all the same. So um, I guess it's a matter of you looking at yourself in terms of what it is that you would like to be doing um, in, in this area. Um, because there are organizations like ours that, you know, this is our agenda. So. I guess the big question would be, should your agenda include something that is, um, or may I try another way? Okay, women's advocacy. If women's, ad, if the organization could look maybe at just being more inclusive of black women or women of color um, and trying to encourage, I know you have done a little of that, but maybe just having more um, women of color and you're not changing your agenda at all you're just trying to be more inclusive of women of color i think carol made a great point a few comments ago about um the protests around george floyd and how so many people came out uh, Carol, you were saying to support that. And uh, I participated in a lot of those protests in the, uh, in the city and here in uh, Bucks County. We had some in um, Laconia. I know there were some in Bristol. Um, and there were so many people being involved and being engaged. And I think that answers part of your question, Ify, is everyone coming together, doing the small things that we can do to advance the work of justice. Um, I can tell you that another thing's been helpful for us is our board engagement in this process. Um, our board has always said, how can we help? You guys are doing um, the racial justice series. How can we be a part of it? We had two of our board members participate as panelists. So um, I just wanna say to the listeners that um, your voice in this fight really matters. Um, and it can be joining a conversation like this. It can be visiting um, a community center, talking about the work that you guys do there and empowering and bringing into the fold 
more women of color, um, as Karen pointed out. So um, I think now we just need folks to know that your voice is important and that there is work to be di done and you're welcome to be a part of the work um, and you can find your path in this work. So we have a, a question um, from the listeners. What do you do in your personal lives to find resilience and keep fatalism or apathy away? And this was asked with gratitude in general for the conversation. But, so what are you guys doing to find resilience and keep fatalism or apathy away? Um, well, maybe I shouldn't have said anything first. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I learned from my, from my job, um, supervising and managing, um, men, um, at times would be, could be challenging. Um, and I had to learn to have, um, faith in what I was doing and, of being uh, trying to be fair across the board and treating them the same as I would anyone else and not be put off by sometimes them being confrontational. And I'm, I'm targeting white males because they could be the most challenging um, because they were not used to, especially at the time that I was doing it, they were not particularly used to taking any direction from a female. Um, and I think I learned a lot from that um, to keep myself, try to keep myself from taking things personally um, and just trying to keep my eye on where I'm trying to go. And Mary Ann Sturry, when she talked about the, that, being that 14 year old, um, her experience is an experience that most of our parents try to protect us from as small, at when we're young. Um, it's not just the talk, but it's just protecting ourselves from that because it has a negative impact on our feelings about ourselves. So, you know, Marianne, I just thought it was really interesting how you talked about being 14 and having that happen. And basically, you're still that 14-year-old girl in later years, um, still trying to make that comment that that person said, go away. And you never get rid of it. It never goes away. Um, and so as parents, we usually try to protect our children from being exposed to that. But I found that uh, my resilience came a lot from me reaching the point. I mean, I'd, I'd have days when I'd come home and I'd call my mother on the phone or I'd stop by and I'd beat her air for, um, you know, for 30 minutes. And, and she was, you know, she, she, she was just, yeah, okay, honey, I know. Yeah, and she would just listen and, and, and she was my therapist and then I would, you know, go home and, and it would, you know, that's how I kept myself going and I had to reach the point where I was like, okay, um, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing um, and I am good at it and I do do a good job and I have to be, um, care about my, I, I have to know that I'm doing what I need to do. And I, you know, I did eventually get to the point where I didn't take those attacks personally. I just needed to, to, to move on. I, I think that's about the best answer I can get, I can give. Um, it was just, a, it was a long battle for quite a while before I just had that, I needed to gain that faith in myself. You know, even today, somebody could say something just off the cuff, and it just it just hits. And 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 then for the next few days, um, it's in the back of my head, and I'm dealing with it, and I'm dealing with it. It's there, 
and I have to bring myself around to let it go. Just let it go. <laughs> wow, that's thanks, Karen. Um, I um, I I was thinking actually, the things that make me feel like um, I could be part of this community day is exactly this. Um, it's the community. It's my resilience probably in large part comes from my belief system, my faith. Um, when I think about being here today on this call with, with all of you, I mean, I, I feel honored. I'm, I'm so grateful that there are leaders like yourself that I can have conversations, I can pick up the phone and talk to. And like Karen, your, your mom, I mean, my husband has heard more, you know, sob stories than um, a little, but I believe that God gave me a purpose and that purpose is in the work that I'm doing today and that we all have a vineyard to tend to. I love that expression that you, you shared from uh, Carol about tending to this race issue. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that all of the experiences I had and I was for, I've been blessed, I've been truly blessed to do things in various contexts corporate jobs, nonprofit jobs, global jobs. Um, I distinctly remember being in, in, in um, China and I had organized a meeting and I remember there's cultural norms in China where, I mean, I wasn't at the head of it. I just, or, I did all the organization, but you walked into this room and I was totally invisible. I was thinking about using that story, but I say all that to say that all of the time that I felt any kind of way, and I, uh, I got to the other side of it, it was through this belief that I had this, that God put me in a vineyard for a purpose. When I was tending and doing what I do in the moment, I look back and say, oh, all of that, those experiences prepared me for where I am today. Mm -hmm and that there was meaning in it. I might not have felt it at the time. So to answer the question about resilience, it comes from just believing that there's a purpose in what I'm doing and that I'm being, I have a, um, I'm being led to do what I'm doing. And where I am today, I'm just, I feel like I'm where God put me, so. We have another question. What can, how can white allies amplify black voices without overreaching? And I will say, I think that there's, um, as people are contemplating, and I don't want to stop anybody from answering, I will, I will add to here, I think that there's been something said today around power. And I think there's a, an importance of paying attention to where power fits and that sometimes the, you know, in so, there are instances where the best way to amplify a black voice is to just give up the microphone and hand it to that person. And that doesn't often happen <laughs> or it doesn't happen as often as it should is probably a better way to put that. Yeah, um, that's a really great. That's, that's exactly what I was going to point to. And I thank you so much for the question the questions, by the way. That's a really great question. Um, I think in addition to um, Ify's point about just hand over the mic, um, don't be afraid. I think one of the things that's out there so much in terms of uh, non-Black people and uh, white people especially is this fear and concern around blowing it. Like, oh my gosh, it's going to mean something like about me. People are going to think I'm a racist or people are going to think whatever there is. Yes, <laughs> that will happen. And I think there's a place where we all just need to let go of that being this, this major desire to be well thought of. You well, know, there's, think... some, there's somebody I appreciate and love who said there are no good people. <laughs> okay, there are no good people. Paul, none of us are good people. Okay, so just let go of our goodness and oh, how great we are and we want people to think and, and just go for it and mess up. 
I mean, I think that's one of the things for me that I'm constantly challenged with, like really confronting what really needs to be done and what I want to do because it's comfortable or it has me look good or just that whole world. So just go for it and know that you're going to mess up and you may have to apologize and apologize and apologize and, you know, get into somebody else's world, but you're doing something. And thank you for that. <laughs> I, I say thank you for doing something. Exactly. I, I'm reminded of I, just the other day, I was watching a talk of the woman who's coordinated the 1619 project. Um, and, and, you know, there were many things. So I encourage people to go track down video of her. She's, uh, she's great. But one of the things that she said when she talked about um, the, asking black people, what should we do? Um, and she had a very matter of fact tone that I had a, a deep appreciation for. And she said, like, you didn't ask us how to build the racist system. I don't know why you're asking us how to take it apart. You know, and there is this piece, I think, too, with this, where what we've seen, um, like, if there's, if there's a desire to amplify a Black voice, then go do it. Like, you didn't ask people that white people weren't asking, can we silence your voice? So you don't have to ask to amplify it. Like there's just go do it. And thank you for going and doing. Um, I also think it's important. And I, and I've said this to, to friends and I actually was saying this to my brother was just this morning that if you look over, if you look at all of this historically and you're really understanding the historical context of racism and, and how things have been built and how it's really baked into all these systems, um, that there are black people continuing to have the conversation and as you know, as Guillaume talks, like continuing to reach for justice and reach for equity, if that isn't the greatest demonstration of a willingness to forgive, I don't know what is. <laughs> so there is a good chance that people may do something wrong or say something wrong or phrase something incorrectly, but there's also a really good chance that there's a Black person in the room who's going to forgive the misstep, maybe try to correct it, <laughs> maybe try to have a conversation about it, but there's an excellent chance that like it, that's not gonna be the thing that causes the whole conversation to fall apart. Like we're gonna still keep fighting for some, some justice. Um, Evie, that reminds me of the conversation that we were having um, yesterday <laughs> in reference to um, uh, white people being hesitant about making a mistake or saying something just wrong or whatever, or doing the wrong thing, um, and and how to handle it. Uh, uh, and I was using the example of uh, I'm sitting in this session, and one of the uh, we we were talking about Jim Crow, and one of the people um, that we were talking about the Jim Crow laws, and one of the people in the group said, "Oh, those Jim Crow laws, they are so awful." They're worse than slavery. And I looked at her and I wasn't sure how, because <laughs> I didn't want to answer her with my immediate reaction to that. Um, uh, and so sometimes if when you're Black and someone says something, you're not always quite sure exactly how to answer it. Um, and so maybe it's like I, I have given thought into uh, if a situation would arise, like how is the best way to engage the person at that point in a conversation? Because they may not really realize what they're saying. They may not have a clear understanding of what slavery was. Um, because after all, they don't teach it in school. And um, so like I'm black, so when I came out of school, I went looking for um, more information. If you're white and you come out of school, since that's not gonna be something that's affecting you, you're not likely to go looking for information. Um, so she truly may not have known what she was actually saying. She may not have had an understanding of what slavery really was. Um, so both were bad, but they, it, there is no comparison to someone owning your whole body. 
um, there just isn't. So uh, um, I think that it's better, I agree that it's better to say something and err and be wrong, but say something. So, um, you know, it, yeah, there are times when it's something simple and you can say something and you kind of know you're on firm ground. And there's other times where it's maybe just a question, uh, I don't understand that. Tell me more about that. Or just to engage someone in the conversation. But on the other hand, I think that um, I, I like to take some responsibility we're trying to use those instances to have a calm and sane conversation as opposed to my first reaction, which is, you said what? <laughs> um, yeah, but they, I, I just think that um, it's, it, it's, you, you get to people one at a time. Yeah, I think that there's a lot more grace out there for messing up and um then you would normally think there is okay i mean i thank you karen i would i would assert that maybe 90 percent of the time people have no idea what they're saying sometimes 90 percent of the time i have no idea what i'm saying <laughs> and the more uncomfortable i am in a situation the more stupid is the stuff that comes out of my mouth yeah. that's yeah. that's kind of how it is for all humans. of us you know, we're uncomfortable, suddenly whoop, we want to say something and it just mm -hmm. is like a stupid, inappropriate thing mm -hmm. that comes out. <laughs> and, and just and, gotta and get comfortable does, with that. <laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't do anything. You know what I mean? It puts the other person, they're like, oops, and they're not getting anything out of it, and you didn't get anything out of it other than to express your anger. So yeah. Yeah. I do want to, um, so there's uh, a couple, there's a, a couple other questions in the chat that we, if we don't get to, I will share the questions with everybody today and, um, and invite them to respond and kind of share that out in further communication. I do want people's recommendations because we know that everybody approaches this type of work or any type of work differently. Some people are readers, some people are researchers, they're gonna bury themselves in the data. Some people are looking for the feelings. And so I'm looking for, from all of you, some recommendation that you might have for people who want to approach it through a book, a podcast, a video, some other content that you might recommend for everybody listening here right now. What's a recommendation that you would make? And I'm not going to hold you to the just one, but I am going to say we're going to speed this in like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to just start with it's, it's an audio book and it's, I almost feel bad, but it, I, I think Michelle Obama's um, biography was just, for me, an inspiring um, story. And while there's all kinds of other books, you know, how to be an anti-racist, et cetera, I just, I like biographies because they inspire me. So. so, thank you. I will say, um, okay, so move. Movies. 13th, you got to watch 13th because it chronic, there, there's so many aspects of that around housing, around um, the criminal justice system and incarceration. It kind of takes you through the journey and, and Jim Crow as a, a new form of slavery and then, you know, um, the incarceration of black men. And then it's just right, lots of statistics and good stories in there. So I think um, it's a must see. The second thing I'll cheat on is Just Mercy, that movie. That movie, I watched that movie and I thought, I want to change careers <laughs> and be a lawyer for the first time ever. It didn't last, trust me. <laughs> but, you know, oh my goodness, that movie reminds you and centers you on how one person standing for something can make a difference and reminds me to stand, you know, whatever that my thing is. Okay, so that's why I make that recommendation. Thanks, Carol. Um, my, well, the, my first one is White Fragility. Um, I know it's been going all over the place and everyone hears. I picked that book up because um, I wanted to better understand where 
white people may be coming from um, to help me to have conversations. I can have conversations with someone black in a, in a blink. And we, you know what I mean? We, 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 we may not have the same backgrounds, the same anything, but that racism piece is something that we, we just all have in common. For white people, they t I found that very often there's an avoidance of the subject and I just wanted to understand why. Um, another one is The Color of Law by Richard uh, Rothstein. And it talks about how the government segregated America. It just helps us to get to better understand um, um, how the government was involved in a lot of, of the segregation and the things that have happened to African Americans. And a simple example is like Levittown. They're always blamed Levitt for Levittown. Turns out that the government made Levitt um, make people sign contracts to not, not sell houses to black people. So the, uh, I just thought that was a really good read. So I'm, I'm going to share some podcasts that I've been trying to get into. Um, and I, one is, uh, let me share this right. So the 1619 is a podcast that folk, you guys probably heard about that. Um, I think it's good. NPR is doing one called uh, Code Switch, um, which talks about a lot of the things that we covered here and how we have to, you know, wear these two different hats and um that kind of thing still processing is another one that that's a good podcast and actually i've been surprised that on hbo there's been some good documentaries around um race and and uh our justice system one that i just watched was uh, a documentary about who it's called who killed garrett it's a really interesting documentary about a young kid unfortunately who uh, was killed and they pretty much, I don't want to give it away, but they pretty much just accused this guy who lived in a community. He was the only black guy who lived there. And that story just takes off from there. It's kind of amazing. Um, that system and how it could happen like that. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have for now. I'm working on some more stuff. I was taking notes too, cause I'm going to read some of the stuff that you guys suggested. Um, but yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> So I will add my own, some of my own recommendations. These are all good recommendations that people have had. And, and I, will, I, I will echo the 1619 project has been, I think, um, really interesting. My, my younger daughter is studying it as a first year seminar in college right now. And so I've gotten to see it through those eyes. And um, if nothing else, it has shifted a conversation into a space that it wouldn't have been in before. And so I think that that's um, really good. Um, I always recommend the book Between the World and Me to people who are mm -hmm. starting. Um, and I've had some people come back to me and say, why in God's name would you give me that book first? It was so challenging. Um, but there is just something I think about capturing this father-son mm -hmm. emotion of uh, that's so body-centered. And so um, I think it's important to feel this conversation as well as intellectualize it. Um, that being said, I also recommend, um, so you want to talk about race, and, I, and there was a piece of this conversation at the beginning of this conversation, um, and it ties in, I think, Guillaume, to something you were saying about there being enough justice for everybody. Um, there is something about just confronting a very particular phrase that she talks about, this idea of uh, this, has been con this racism has been constructed to assure people that they will have more because other people have less. Mm -hmm. And yes. that we really have to kind of tear that apart, I think, um, to get to this, I, to really remember there's more than enough. It's not just that there's enough, there is more than enough justice for all of us. Um, so those are, I narrowed myself to two, <laughs> though I had several others, um, but those are the two. So I, paying attention to time, I want to make sure that I say to all of you again, how grateful I am to all of you for being willing to participate in this conversation, to share your stories, to share your experiences, 
um, to step into that vulnerability and um, and 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 really uh, let all of us kind of be in this space together. Um, it is. Uh, I think there's many many things on each of your resumes that speak to why you are considered great leaders. I think that ability to do what you've done this morning is kind of tops of my list of what really um, has been an incredible demonstration of leadership. So I wanna say thank you for all of that. Um, to everybody who has joined us here this morning to listen, to participate, um, I also wanna say thank you to all of you for taking the time and making the time. Uh, time is an incredible gift. So making the time to be here, be present, to listen, and allow space for this conversation to happen. And to, frankly, uh, the board of directors for handing us the mic and, uh, and amplifying the voices of uh, just some of the Black leadership in the coalition. I want to say thank you to everyone for that. Um, I'll echo the announcement to mark your calendars for our November meeting. Uh, I hope to see people there. I encourage people to visit the Bucks County Women, Women's Advocacy Coalition website to learn more. If you are not a partner, you can become a partner. That's all on the website. So please do that. Um, um, you, uh, yes. Can I make a quick mention? Um, sure. The N NAACP, um, I will send a flyer over, but we're doing an understanding white privilege and a white ally. A, a two-part series that um, some that people may be interested I'll, I'll, in. I'll, I'm happy to share it out. So thank you for sending that. Um, I just want to say again, thank you to everybody. Look for a follow-up to this. Well, there's it was recorded, so we'll make sure to share that out for anybody who maybe wants to watch it again or missed a part or wants to share it. Um, and certainly, I hope to see you all engaging in the work of the coalition. Um, Thank you, everybody, and thank you to all of you on my panel. Thank you for being my co-conspirators. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right, everyone have a great Bye. day. <laughs>